so bakery i think is close to everybody's heart now who doesn't love cakes and mousses and everything and so this session i hope would be interesting for all of us to get more insight as a consumer as well uh, on panel we have mr dhruv sanyal from berry call uh, calbout india private limited he is the managing director uh, we have uh, Uh, we have mr krishna mohan from uh, regional president middle east india and africa from novazine uh, uh, we also have mr hamid chief operating officer ferrero india private limited so uh, we have mr rajneet singh kohli Red, yes i pronounced it correctly chief executive officer and executive director britannia industries and uh, ms gitika mehta hershey's india managing director uh, the moderator for this session is uh, dr so the moderator for the session is dr harinder singh obray director national institute of food technology entrepreneurship and management uh, sir i would like to Uh, very good afternoon i think uh, if you had your lunch it's a good time for desserts and uh, desserts can't be but i mean you can't have desserts without chocolates and being a person who's been associated with fssci earlier i was scientific advisor to fssci and we had this concept of fopnl coming up which in fact to be honest to you not to be quoted has become has become a pain in the neck for fssci itself now uh you used to talk about this but i said like you know how can you put up a star rating for a product which is being widely consumed all over the world then somebody said no no we'll add some nuts into it we'll add some millets into it that will improve the score so i said you do also the innovation but people would not leave eating chocolates and the way the bakery industry has grown in the past in our country i mean we see a cagr of about 11 to 12% and uh, it's expected that another 5 years it's going to be around 1800 to 1850 billion rupees industry it's one of the largest industries which is uh, a part of this food processing ecosystem and uh, bakery you can see the you know, the, the level of processing which has increased yesterday the honorable uh, prime minister was talking about that the processing capacity has gone up from uh, 12 lakh to 200 lakh mil- uh, metric tons and bakery and confectionery are an integral part of that and uh, in this session we have the galaxy of stars i don't really need to introduce them they've already been introduced and we are going to discuss about a lot of things which will be uh, relevant from the regulatory perspective the raw materials ingredients how to expand the value chain and uh, of course positioning marketing of uh, the bakery and uh, uh, confectionery products the r&d requirements and how academia and industry can collaborate and uh, you know create make a dent for itself and then see that the government policies <coughs> align with the requirements of the industry so with this uh, i would not like to take uh, much time i would straight away go to uh, i would request the speakers to just uh, come here and I mean, uh, come to the podium and give their perspective on different aspects we talk about expanding value chain in baking bakery and confectionery so the value chain basically starts from the farmer and it starts from wheat it goes into flour then you add certain products the potable water the sugar the fat or in case of bread the yeast and then you get a product then the second most important aspect is the packaging and of course taking it to the market so uh, mr dhruv sanyal will be talking about how to expand the entire value chain in the bakery and confectionery ecosystem i would request uh, mr sanyal to just come over and give his perspective about what he thinks about uh, the way forward for this particular industry <laughs> thank uh, dr obray and uh, great to uh, meet up with all of you over here uh, just to introduce barry calabo to the audience over here we are the world's largest cocoa processor and the largest b2b chocolate uh, manufacturers 
and we are in, I am intrinsically linked with all the panelists except for Lidnovozyme in terms of uh, being a supplier to most of the chocolate companies around the world. But we, because of that, we also have a sense of responsibility in terms of ensuring we add value through variety of things. And it starts with upstream, right from our cocoa farms, because sustainability is becoming a big issue within the cocoa industry. And it's an issue which has caught governmental attention, especially in uh, Europe, where they are extremely concerned about the presence of lab uh, labor in the, in the supply chain, the issue of deforestation and cultivation of cocoa on the deforested land. So uh, EU is, has already come out with legislations. And as a leader in the industry, we are driving from our perspective the sustainability piece and uh, right up to uh, traceability to the farm levels in terms of ensuring that there is <coughs> less uh, or no labor, no slave labor in our value, our value chain. There is uh, proper compensation on the beans that we buy from that perspective. The other aspect on the upstream side is the fact that uh, quality is very critical for our customers, whether it be a biscuit customer or a chocolate customer or an ice cream customer. And the consistency is very critical for their <coughs> product. And we try to ensure that we deliver consistent quality across all our plants, whether it be chocolate or whether it be cocoa. And that's something that has been our motto through all our journey uh, as a history uh, within Barry Calibo. The next uh, piece is on the midstream, because we are not present on the downstream side. <laughs> I mean, our customers are essentially the downstream people. Uh, on the midstream, we have been quite engaged in terms of innovation, driving innovation within the chocolate industry. So uh, <coughs> in 2017, uh, for people who are aware, uh, we launched Ruby Chocolate, which was uh, at that, we call it as the f uh, fourth type of chocolate after dark milk and white. So <laughs> Ruby Chocolate came in, and very recently, last year, we launched what we call the second generation chocolate, wherein we are reducing sugar in our chocolate as an ingredient. Sugar is number one, but we made it number two and very less complicated recipe. So if you have a dark chocolate, it just has two ingredients. It's cocoa and it has sugar. And in the milk, just three ingredients, <laughs> milk, sugar, and uh, cocoa. So we are <laughs> looking at from a, our customers, consumers, because they are asking for reduced sugar. They are looking for simplification in labeling. And, and that's been our journey on the value chain to add to what our customers, consumers are essentially asking for and uh, tailoring ourselves to their requirements from that perspective. So one of the things that we do very well is engage very closely with all our customers in terms of driving innovation, but also driving their sustainability piece. So I think uh, across all the chocolate manufacturers, we are in their sustainability programs. We engage both at the farm levels in terms of supporting their sustainability program, whether it be Mondelez or whether it be Ferro or any of the uh, chocolate <coughs> manufacturers. So that's been our journey and that's the journey we continue to move forward because sustainability is going to become a bigger issue, especially in the cocoa industry because if you look at the production of cocoa, it's growing at 1%, the consumption is growing at 2%. And uh, we are essentially seeing that in a lot of places, you take Indonesia, where crops have come down because farmers were not getting adequately compensated, or they've found a better option in terms of their farming uh, incomes. And uh, the crop has come down from, it used to be 300,000, today it's 180,000 tons of uh, crop. So unless as a company we are engaged in terms of improving their living incomes, it's going to be a very difficult story within the cocoa uh, industry. And that's probably also the realization of all the chocolate manufacturers uh, in terms of ensuring that they help to uh, in 
uh, improve the income, the living standards of the farmers and people who are the stakeholders in this industry. Thanks. Oh, wonderfully, sir. I think I have a sweet tooth, so I just can't resist eating chocolates. And uh, Mr. Sanyal talked about uh, the R&Ds and innovations. And there's one company which has been at the forefront as far as uh, the actual research in enzyme production, purification is concerned, and that is Novozyme. I've used the enzymes while I was uh, researching on production of uh, you know, bioethanol from uh, the paddy straw and a lot of other straws. And then we've used their enzymes for uh, clarification and improving the extraction efficiency of fruit juices from fruits. So this is one company, Novozyme has got a lot of ingredients also, this is one company which is doing a lot of R&D. And I think uh, the specifications or ingredients, the certification for the ingredients is as important as the final product is. So I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Mr. Krishna Mohan Puwadaji as to what kind of R&D they are doing in uh, ingredients and for the processing also. What is it that, you know, kind of collaborations they are looking forward to with the academy or with other industries so that you take this enzyme business to a di different level. It's, it's not only for the commercial perspective, but it also matters when it comes to the purity of the enzymes encapsulation of enzyme, purity of enzyme. So there's a lot of upscaling that is required. I'd like to hear from you, sir. Thank you, Obiraji. And uh, just a couple of uh, seconds. Uh, no, we, I, I represent Novozymes. Novozymes is the market leader in uh, industrial enzymes and microbes. So we have a lot of applications. Uh, uh, Obiraji talked about uh, 2G alcohol and ethanol and all of those, but today's uh, context I'll just limit it to bakery and confectionery and food science. Now it's a very, very interesting uh, topic and when we talk about innovation and we talk about food, I think one of the paramount uh, features in the food is that whatever innovation, it has to meet the palate, it has to meet the taste, it has, and that is uh, so supreme out uh, there. So which also means that uh, you need to have a lot of uh, local understanding, localization in terms of uh, ingredients, processing, what do consumers like, and all of those uh, things. And towards this, uh, the, the partnership is extremely essential. We need to understand uh, with stakeholders in terms of what is needed and work together. But uh, I'll, I'll just take uh, a little bit in terms of uh, where innovation is happening within this space uh, when I look from enzymes and microbes. Uh, and, and food is starting from agriculture, so when we look from that angle, it's uh, starting with uh, reduction in pesticides, reduction in insecticides in the natural way. Now, uh, we need to make sure that we tackle the problem at the source. So this is one way where we are investing quite a bit in terms of technology. So there's elements of bio uh, control measures, uh, which I think is a super important for a country like us. Now, uh, some of our technologies also help increase yield by 12, 15%, which would mean that a significant amount of, from a sustainability benefit that, uh, so just as an example, we have some of our technologies which get 15% yield increase in corn. Now, when we look at uh, corn and sugarcane, when we look at 15% of sugarcane, we are essentially releasing a state of Kerala, just to put the context out there. So you release the size of Kerala for doing something else. That's the magnitude of these changes. But more importantly, from a health perspective and benefit perspective, the downstream, there's a lot of other uh, benefits which come in. Now, as food processing becomes a lot more important, one of the fundamental things I think is super important is how can we prevent, how can we protect the naturalness? How can we bring in more functionality into the food? And therein lies a lot of uh, innovation, which uh, as a company we look in. Now, uh, snacking is, uh, everybody likes, all of us like out there. How can we bring in the health quotient out uh, there? Now, uh, uh, when we look at uh, India, I think India, we have a lot of uh, biscuit eating population and uh, uh, we, we simply love our food. Now, within the biscuits and within the cookies, there's also a huge amount of uh, fats, uh, salt, sugar, and all, all the snacks out there. So. When we look from a Novozymes perspective, we have regional application teams which are working on how you can reduce fat, 
how can you can eliminate some amount of uh, fat from the cookies, make it healthier. And th th those are some examples out there. That's very localized out here. As we move along, we are also seeing a lot more uh, eating out, uh, calling in food, uh, and also processed, ready to eat segment out there. Now in all of these uh, segments, how do you bring in and protect the naturalness? That is where we are looking at extension of shelf life, uh, properties in uh, chapatis, in parathas. Uh, so that's, that's also something uh, which is very, very interesting. Now we're also seeing uh, you know, fermented uh, batter uh, ready to eat uh, or ready to make dosa, idli, batter coming in. Uh, I think it's a lot of convenience uh, out uh, there. How do you bring in functionality? How do you sort of elevate the properties out there? So that's also something that as a company we are working. Now baked goods also have uh, uh, a lot of impact in terms of uh, acrylamide formation and acryl acrylamide is uh, carcinogenic. Now technologies in terms of how you can reduce the acrylamide uh, to acceptable levels which can then bring down uh, the, this uh, unwanted substance into our, into our snacks. Now these are all some things which uh, I think is very, very relevant. I also think that as, uh, as a country when we try to uh, have an aspiration of a developed nation, I think we also need to sort of strive that our regulations are also more advanced. Uh, we are sitting with the regulations which are a little bit outdated. I think it's an opportunity for us to go hand in hand with an aspiration of a developed nation and uh, thereby sort of provide functionality, provide good food, good science into whatever we eat. Now, uh, dietary fiber is also very important from a health perspective. Uh, and we are now today working in an Indian context with the substrates that we uh, work here or available like milk. How can you increase the dietary fiber in milk? Right, and there are so many benefits of uh, doing this uh, from a health perspective, from uh, improving the gut uh, uh, microflora and all of these. So all of these things is about coming together to make sure that we have the right food, right uh, thing, and that is the prevention for a lot of subsequent problems. So I think we need to have a paradigm shift, but I also think that uh, for this to happen, it's about coming together uh, collaboration, industry, academia, universities, academia. We need to find the answers. And the answers are definitely possible because today, a lot of, for a lot of the problems that we face, I think uh, Mother Earth and nature has the solutions. So let's tap into that and make ourselves a better place. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, we all need to make Mother Earth a better place to live, especially which our own Mother Earth, which holds about 140 crores of us. It's a big task and big challenge for all of us here. I, uh, I really appreciate that point. You talked about the acrylamides. In fact, when I was at FSCI, the first survey I did was on uh, trans fats and acrylamides. And we had about 7,600 odd samples that we collected from all over the country. And that time, in fact, my CEO and chairperson both asked me, why are you doing it for acrylamides when we don't have standards? I said, we need to start from somewhere. We need to have standards for acrylamides because tomorrow we we'll start importing products and somebody will tell us, like, you know, you haven't even, or even for exports also, we need to have these kind of standards and the labs ready to analyze acrylamides. And uh, I just took three segments. Uh, that is one of the fried, uh, the, the fried segment, the baked segment, the composite segments just like the burgers and the pizzas and all that. And uh, we could find uh, some of the samples, there were about 2.5 or 2.8% samples which had non-compliant for acrylamides when I was taking the acrylamide content of European Union because India does not have standards for acrylamides. On basis of that, then I presented a paper in Hague, I mean one of my colleagues presented a paper which I had prepared for him, that the concept paper for uh, uh, setting standards for acrylamides. That was in the, the Codex Elementary Commission so now FSSA has to do a countrywide surveillance again, specifically for acrylamides. And then we have to present that paper again with uh, all the data in the next uh, CSE meeting that's likely to be held in April in 2024. 
And then if it sees, you know, everything, uh, all, all of the, the member countries are convinced, then there'll be a standard which will be set by India for the world. So that is what we're looking at, and we look forward to working with the Novozyme in seeing that how do we reduce the acrylamide content and also look at the sources. Can we reduce the temperature of frying? Can we reduce the temperature in baking without compromising the quality, without compromising the functionality as we talked about? So there's so much we can do about acrylamides together. Now, I think responsible sourcing is something which is very, very important. And uh, you know, there's one chocolate which is pretty expensive, but it's very different. The packaging is different, the taste is different, the look is different, it appears very elegant, and it's definitely uh, exorbitantly priced for a person like me. <laughs> and that is Ferraro. I hope, I'm sure all of you are going to agree with that but not the person who's sitting here. So we'd like to uh, ask him that what is it like, how are they sourcing the raw material for producing the Ferrero chocolates? And also, uh, is that, what are the economies of scale so as to make Ferrero the Ferrari, and not the Ferrari, sorry, for something which is our Maruti, and everybody is able to consume that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roberoy. So yes, Ferrero is, uh, I would just uh, jump off what you said. Ferrero is uh, an expensive product uh, in India. But you know, and I thank uh, Gitika here to have uh, raised the point yesterday about the custom duties that is extremely high. So that's why the cost to consumer is also high. Uh, and raised the point, and then yesterday, you know, there was uh, this session with uh, our Minister of Commerce where he also shared his point of view on how we can uh, bring it forward uh, in the future. Today, yes, uh, Ferrero Rocher is uh, imported and then imported from, uh, from Italy, uh, sourced with uh, the ingredients. So ingredients, one of the ingredients, one of the most of important ingredients for Ferrero Rocher is, uh, is hazelnut, but also cocoa. My colleague here uh, shared the point of cocoa this morning. 100% of our cocoa is sustainable. So from uh, Ivory Coast, yes, it has a price, a high price. Today, I cannot, uh, I cannot produce Ferrero Rocher in India. Why? Because India has no hazelnut production, has no uh, farmers are not producing hazelnut, farmers are not producing cocoa, farmers are not producing uh, palm oil, which is also one of the components. So we are all importing all uh, those uh, ingredients from different geographies to Europe. All our plants are Europe-based, but we have one plant here in India, in Baramati. We have started this journey with, uh, with India 15 years ago. 15 years ago, when we started, we sa started as a social enterprise. We did not go to the tier one city, tier two city, but we went to tier three city in Baramati. When we started as a social enterprise, we want to give uh, to the local. So one of the motto of Ferrero, Ferrero is create value, work hard to develop the value and donate. And this is what we uh, have been doing for many years. So when we started in India, we started by donating. So at that time we have created uh, Inganwadis. So uh, we have created eight Inganwadis in a, in a the area of Baramati. And today, 400 children are continuously coming to those Ingan bodies to ensure, and then education is provided, food is provided, so also families are there uh, educated, and then on the food safety, health, sports, so everything is done there to ensure that uh, also the community where the plant is, we, uh, they'll be able to uh, to provide uh, sources. Rocher, yes, one part, but we have Ferrero Rocher moment. So I would like to discuss about uh, this point because today Ferrero Rocher is a melting product. In India, we have 4 million stores that are selling chocolate. I cannot sell Rocher in 4 million stores. Why? Because Ferrero is melting and those stores are not equipped to, uh, to have Rocher and then to uh, to ensure that the quality is passed to the consumer. Since we are paying uh, 
a high premium price, the consumer deserve a quality, a high quality. And today, only 20,000 stores in India is able to offer us quality standard to provide to the, to the shopper. Therefore, it was a challenge. How we, uh, we try to overcome that challenge? We have decided to uh, create uh, an R&D department in India. So a couple of years back, we have put an R&D session in India, in Baramati, where we can create prolines, offer prolines, a high premium prolines to maybe 4 million stores and then to be able to reach, uh, you said, 140 crores uh, population. I'm not sure we are able to, to get there, but uh, at least uh, this was the, the idea on how to start uh, bringing premium prolines at an affordab affordable price because it is made in India. Then we created Ferrero Rocher Moment. Ferrero Rocher Moment was launched from India to the rest of the world. Now we have a base of products that are created in India in our R&D department, through our R&D department. We have Ferrero Rocher Moment, we have Kinder Creamy, we have, Ferrero Choc we have Chocobon Crispy that has, has been launched uh, two months ago. We have now a portfolio that is able to reach our consumers here in India, but outside of India. Now we are servicing also Middle East, Southeast Asia. So yesterday when we were speak, speaking about you know, exporting uh, to uh, outside of India, our plant today is able to export 50% of the production outside of India. So this is the mission that we have decided to put and the effort that we wanted to put here is to bring also affordable chocolate at a high quality standard having sourced completely certified we have signed so many charters whatever in uh, with the palm oil with the hazelnut or with the cocoa to ensure that we are fully quality control through the supply chain that we have so this is the the mission that uh, we have here in india thank you so much I mean, I'm so thrilled to see that you know, Ferrero should be reaching each and every household in the country soon. But then, uh, and uh, great, I mean, commendable work in R&D that you've been doing. But then there's something which is already there in our homes. And, you know, we, we wish, we, before we crash into the bed, we say good night. And uh, we start our day, we say good day. So we have, we have somebody with us who's been uh, the company that has... Uh, grown uh, leaps and bounds that expanded from the bakery items out of the dairy items also and then they've got a good sizable market share and they have their own R&D uh, facilities and the production units are placed, I mean they're located all over the country uh, and we are very honored and pleased to have uh, the CEO and executive director of this company, Mr. Rajneet Singh Kohliji from uh, Britannia Industries and uh, we would like to hear from you sir about uh, you know, when you talk about the scale, I think there's something bakery, every, we just, it's something like the indispensable. The market is going to increase, the share is going to increase, the biscuits, you come, you come out with various varieties, you come with the dark biscuits, the cocoa biscuits, the normal biscuits, biscuits with low fats, low sugars. And that's something I see that uh, it is, everybody consumes them, people from all strata, from all ages consume them. So what do you look, what do you, how do you see the, uh, the scale of operations and reach of the bakery products to the rural households. In fact, we have already reached the rural households, uh, but then when, when you try to have new products which are a little expensive and how do you plan to position them and what kind of R&D innovations that you're looking at uh, for uh, a better outreach. And I would also want to ask you, since uh, you are uh, the one who's representing bakery segment here, what are the expectations of the bakery se segment from the government as well as the food regulator? I know there are a lot of questions that I put across. Uh, I'd like to hear from you, sir. Very good afternoon. I know the session after lunch is, I always call it, when I talk to the teams, like a graveyard session. It's very important. So my job is to keep you awake for the next 
10 minutes if I speak the rest. You know, thank you and a lot of questions there. Uh, it's said like an examination paper. But I hope I can answer a few of those. Uh, you know, Britannia, I, we always say, you know, it's, it's a in, made in India company. I mean, always been, while the name sounds different, but um, it's a hundred years plus old company, I was to, all told, you know, it's a lot of reputation. I say it's a hundred years young company. Young company because I think we just got started. While we're known for biscuits, uh, this is a company which is there in bread, rusk, cake. Now we're getting into croissant, we got into dairy, cheese, drinks, and so on. And I'll talk about more about innovation as well. And, uh, and it's extremely important at the heart of everything that we keep innovating. Uh, I don't know if, uh, from, you know, just to let you know, you know, it was the first company uh, that introduced sliced bread in India in 1954. I don't know whether you're aware of that. The first bourbon biscuit was introduced by Britannia in 1955. Uh, the Mari biscuit that we all know of was introduced by Britannia again in 1960. So a lot of us, not even born at that time, and a lot of us have grown over, over these uh, businesses there. And I'm not here to talk about the largeness and the bigness of the organization. The good part I feel very proud is that this company, we also export to more than 80 countries today. We have more than 90 plants, 18 of our own, uh, and uh, presence in many countries there. But what's importantly, and I'm going to talk something very different is, uh, what's what if I future forward this organization, uh, what, what should it mean for us as an organization? What should it mean for people? And uh, how do we get there uh, sustainably and responsibly? That's more important. So I'm going to tweak the, some of the questions that you asked me, and I'm going to you know, uh, use my own bit to use this forum to think about what I believe uh, there. And our vision uh, at Britannia is to become a responsible total food company. You know, the word responsible is important, and I'll talk more about it. We have uh, five pillars. Uh, like most organizations, FMCGs are here, bakery guys are there. It's about distribution, marketing, innovation, cost efficiency. But the last one, and that's close to my heart, is about, uh, about being sustainable. And uh, there are three pillars to our sustainable, uh, you know, sustainability, uh, kind of if I say the bedrock of it. I genuinely believe and I always say that a strong edifice can only be built on a strong foundation. And the strong foundation for our organizations to be 100 years young and, and many more 100 years to come has to be built on a sustainable basis. So we have three pillars, like most companies would have. First one is, of course, about people. 40% uh, of our workforce in our factories is women. So we genuinely believe in diversity. We want to get to 50% by 2024, uh, looking at all opportunities for them in terms of the training, skilling them, all those work also happens. But very interesting thing, work happens, which I, when I was not part of Britannia, till a year and a half, I wasn't aware of even, which is we have a Britannia Nutrition Foundation that works in nine of the states, some 450 villages, some couple of lakh Anganwadis, and we've impacted positively life of more than two lakh kids already. India, as you know, a lot of our kids are malnutrition, and uh, you know, there's a deficiency in terms of uh, there. And uh, so we've got a special biscuit. It's not there for sale. Uh, it's iron fortified. It's got all those micronutrients that's required to be there. And what happens is because of this, and I was in a village in, uh, um, in Uttarakhand, and I went and visited these things. You know, he says because the kids come to school because for that biscuit, because they get that three biscuits every day that we give, that's what required. And then we get the mothers to come and drop in because a lot of the mothers are anemic as well, and there's malnutrition. And therefore, the things are improving around. And I didn't genuinely think about it till that time that how important this is for us to really, really make an impact on the business. So there's, there's a lot of work that we do on Britannia Nutrition Foundation. We don't talk about it, and I don't intend to use this forum to talk about it, but I believe that every of our organizations, we can create products that can make a difference, uh, not for sale, but can really make, because we know the know-how, we know the technology, we know how to bring the cost down. Uh, I was here with the Bihar, uh, just uh, uh, unit there with the chief secretary there, and we were discussing, we just set up a plant. And he shared, and there's somebody in the field shared, you know what? Hamare aapka Mari biscuit baut dikta hai. Sorry, I'm going to transfer this to a little bit of Hindi there. And uh, I said, ha, hamara sabse bada product is Mari, and it's five rupees packet. There are a lot of biscuits in five rupees. He says, you know what? Uh, aapka biscuit kaise use hota hai? I said, I'm also curious, but I didn't realize that how many people, maybe in the morning, they dip it in the way. He said, nahi, biscuit ko paani mein ghol ke hum peete it's potion. It's, it's end of the day, it is, it is food for us, in a way, it's because you can't get a good quality product at five rupees that you can mix it in water and have that. I mean, there are things that you learn every day as well, uh, as leaders of businesses, and how important it is to get 
uh, you know, value driven products in the market. And we are not Ferrari or Ferrari, uh, Roche for sure, but we are there in more than 94% households. You're talking about reach. We make 15 billion packs of biscuits and products. That means every Indian, we serve a pack a month. That's, that's the kind of consumption that happens on the ground there. Uh, the other P for us is product. Of course, there's work to be done on the product side itself. I mean, as an organization, we can't shy away from that. And uh, just to share with you, we're the first company, in fact, in the, uh, in the packaged food industry that is 100% trans fat free. All our products are 100% trans fat free. 100% uh, of we do uh, plastic recycling. That means of whatever tons of plastic that we put out, we do the recycling. And in fact, we declared that almost one and a half years back. So we're ahead on that. Uh, part of this. 50% uh, of our products have micronutrients and we are on a mission of reducing both sodium and salt uh, uh, and sugar in our products and we are well, well on track in terms of target that we set up for reducing 8% and 6% there. These are numbers, right? Internal. It can be whatever. But as an organization, absolutely driven to ensure that, you know, we make a difference to the environment and, and the country that we live in. And uh, as you said, Mother uh, India, mother, whatever the world, we want to really give back there as well. Uh, the last one and important one is the planet, which is 30% uh, of our plants. We look at renewable energy, can be more. I am not happy with these numbers. I keep telling, you know, we've got so many plants across, even with our co-packers, 95 of them. How many of them are renewable energy? How are you getting there? Uh, there's a big revolution and I'm, I'm an absolutely incorrigible, optimistic guy. Believe in the India story. Uh, this EV revolution that's happening in India, how are we getting that into our plants, secondary distribution, you know, we, we get to the length and breadth of the country, but how are we getting EV to our distributors' vehicles? Because I've seen the power A of it really, really bringing the cost down, but the impact does it make on the uh, business as well. So um, we are looking at becoming, um, you know, committed to becoming 100% EPR, which is your extended product responsibility as well. That means going out and ensuring uh, the right things to be done in terms of collecting plastic waste to all, all kind of renewable products as well. Uh, so those are, those are three pillars to my mind uh, while business is there and I'm sure the teams on the ground will continue to grow. But it's very important that heart of all our businesses, the sustainability agenda is there. Uh, you talked about the last question, probably I try to answer that on innovation now. Uh, as I said, if you need to be 100 years young and need to be relevant, you need to keep innovating. So we've, we now from Britannia, uh, moving into, we always say, you know, uh, good for you in terms of what you eat, but also what you drink. So we've got a set up a dairy plant in, in uh, Ranjangao in Pune, where we collect more than now 250,000 liters of milk. Uh, we've launched our own milk drinks, of course, which is there's winking cow, crossed 150 crores last year, uh, milkshakes, rich shakes, all, all that kind of products there happening. We've uh, launched croissant, we've done a partnership. We also realize after COVID, and I'm sure otherwise as well, that you can't be alone. There needs to be partnerships. You know, a couple of partners are here on the table as well. So we've done partnership with the uh, Chipita Foods, which is a Greek-based company. We does croissant. We don't know how to make croissant. So, how, but how can you get not that expensive French croissant? Uh, and I paid four euros last three days back when I was in France for a conference. Uh, but 20 rupees croissant is what we we bring to India. That, that's what we launched there, so that mothers can give it to their kids. It's end of the day. I was telling somebody saying, "Oh, it's croissant. It's fancy. It's." You know, I said it's bread butter jam, yeah. Simple. It's <laughs> hai. Pehle wo bana ke karte the, now we're giving in a package form. And, and that's, that's the way we look at there. We we'll, we'll just launched makhanas into some bit of in terms of snacking with Better Snack Co. We also launched our bars this, the, this month, which is about BU, which is Believe in Yourself, which is Protein and Nutrition Bars. So we have to keep innovating. I don't know which one of them will work not, but we're very clear that on the bakery side, how we can expand and keep innovating, right? So happy to be here and uh, really learn from all the stalwarts here and from you guys here. Thank you. Uh, I think the take home message is innovations, innovations, innovations. And uh, what actually innovations go into is that uh, I'm really impressed with the, the, the chivalrous activity that you're carrying out and giving those, uh, you know, developing those products with the, which are rich in uh, vitamin B12, iron. And I would really want to see that in case if these can be put into the government, in the government PDS schemes, the MD, uh, the midday meal schemes, that'll be highly beneficial. I mean, it's just getting into the government system and you know, letting them know that this is what we are doing. And maybe uh, at that point in time, we may not, uh, we, it may not be all that free, but maybe at a very uh, reasonable cost. 
but it's quite insightful you know whatever we heard from uh, mr kohli was quite insightful and there's so much of learning like what the company is doing and how they're diversifying and there's another company which i think has been doing a lot of innovations and uh, and that has been with the bodhi wali chocolates the chocolates with the what we call it as kisses i mean i was young and uh, you know somebody from uh, my uh, somebody from us got us those chocolates they were they were different they were not like the non routine bars that we get here not those dairy milk or the five star bars and all that that had a bodhi on it was something which was different you know, it was wrapped in silver and golden color wrappers and then i used to call it bodhi wali chocolate that's why i said so now that bodhi wali chocolate of course they have a big big plant in um, i think philadelphia no mistake pennsylvania and that is their hub and then the people go to in fact what i've heard i don't know i've never been to pennsylvania but what i've heard about is that people go to pennsylvania especially to see their plant it's it's a, it's a marvel on earth that's what they say so that marvel on earth will be in india soon i mean the product has already come in india so we look forward to asking you about you know what is uh, the landscape you're looking at and what is what are the even as per you what are those uh, market trends in uh, the confectionery largely and of course something about the bakery if you can talk about look forward to hearing so we have uh, ms geetika mehta from thank you thank you so yes i represent hershey's uh, which is uh, the kisses product it's called the plume uh, globally but yes it can also be called whichever way you would like to uh, so maybe a little bit about hershey's um, and some of you may have got it as gifts from your cousins you know in when they come from the us in their big large size packs that you get to share that was my first interaction with the brand as well and uh, you know since then it's always been a very aspirational brand it's always been something special international top quality and that's what we hope to continue in the sense of what we we now of course make in india uh, we have our own production facilities we have third party production facilities um so that's how she's in how it was in the past since 2020 we have launched chocolates in india so made in india for india so it's still in its infancy as far as the launch for india is concerned and i think as you were referring we have a lot of innovations um it stems from doing what is right for the consumers here so here and of course a lot of you i hope have a sweet tooth indian consumers do have a slightly higher sweet palate than the than the us consumers so we tweak our formulations to cater to who's going to eat them you know we just don't cut copy paste what works across we do what is right for us here in india and that has been a very important part of every single thing we create so we have of course uh, hershey syrups uh, we have milk shakes we have spreads uh, we have sofit which is a plant based um, beverage all of these are catered to the indian palate and i think one important stand kind of uh, principle that we follow is do what is right for india uh the other thing that uh, is really at the mainstay for us uh, uh, as i mentioned 2020 is how we launched it already chocolates is our largest part of our portfolio it is almost number 3 in the premium segment and the, uh, the other thing is really innovation so of course do what is right but keep innovating it is an impulse category it is something that you want to see new flavors of you don't want to eat the same dessert day in and day out so uh, we've launched hazelnuts we we import hazelnuts and we make it here so we've launched uh, hazelnut kisses we do different things in order to cater to different you know uh, requirements um, and the third thing that we look at in our products is accessible so um uh, as as uh, dr obero was calling uh, you know a ferrari uh, well we try to make ours a little bit more accessible so i'm um, slightly going to change into hindi but ideally har ghar hershey's which basically means every home should have a hershey right so we've now launched a product which is at 20 rupees so we have a choco tubes at 20 uh, for those of you uh, it's 25 cents uh, us cents yeah so that's how accessible we make a product we keep the international we make it a uh, extremely tasty product but we also want to make that aspiration accessible for consumers to have it so that has really been a bit of a mainstay of how our product philosophy goes uh to the point of the kind of um, uh you know trends that we are seeing in the confectionery industry so uh, a lot of the trends um are really across the premium segment so the industry is about a 1.5 billion dollar industry in india uh one third so about a 500 million is premium 
which is where Hershey's primarily plays. And a billion is actually the 5, 10, 20 rupee uh, kind of price points. We're seeing a lot of innovations happening in the premium segment. So from a trend lens, that's really where the action is. Um, the other things we're seeing is gifting. You know, suddenly gifting is becoming a big component of how uh, confectionery is looked at. And I'm sure you see that around, um, you know, this week was, was Halloween. Five years ago, nobody had heard of Halloween. And now my society had like 200 kids running around just kind of collecting trick or treat candy. So these are the trends of gifting that has moved. And we have this big cycle of gifting starting from Rakhi. Um, goes on, of course, to Diwali, Halloween, uh, Christmas, uh, all the way up to Valentine. So that's really the, the trend around uh, gifting that we see. And of course, I have uh, Mondelez join us as well, so maybe they can add some color on the trends of the category. Um, and the other, other parts of the things that we are seeing are the fact that everybody is trying to come into different flavors, right? Uh, I referred to that, that's part of our product philosophy, but the category is doing the same. So again, from a trend lens, it's always to cater to what is right for, and what is exciting, different flavors. We now have a, a guava chili chocolate. Yeah, it's not ever going to be mainstream, but it brings that little slight spiciness or you have some goji berry, you know? So it's not the usual chocolate that everybody's been eating forever. It's about the new trends, what can we capitalize on? So yeah, that's a little bit on the trends. Um, specifically coming back to Hershey, I think what has been important for us, like I mentioned, product, but also people. Yeah, that is a very, very important part of how we function. And frankly, eventually, once everybody's digitized, everything is automated, people will be the big differentiator. Uh, you know, and the companies which attract the best kind of people are the ones which will really deliver the best kind of performance. Uh, so with that, we, uh, of course, have a very compelling, uh, you know, philosophy of how we grow and groom our employees. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Kohli mentioned diversity. Our factory till last year, we had zero women in the shop floor. It's in Mandideep. It's two hours from Bhopal, not maybe the most safest place. Today, I'm proud to say we have 100 women on the shop floor as a result of the fact that we want to take on these things. Yeah, we want to be uh, a more diverse organization. We want to get in, our, our head office is already 50% diversity. I mean, our consumers, 70% of our shoppers are women. You know, our decisions get made by them. And therefore, we must also have them represented in our factories, in our uh, offices, in our sales teams as well. So people, and of course, I mentioned diversity as one sub-segment of it, but people is really a big, big part of what we focus on. So yeah, I think I would just like to wrap up by saying, uh, the trends, this is a growing category, a 10% cargoed easily in this category. Uh, Hershey is outpacing it and driven really by products and by people. Thank you. I think uh, Geetha Ji, have, Geetha Ji has touched so many points, right from uh, the innovations and then uh, to the gender biasness. And then now, of course, the policies will also be driven by the Anari Shakti because the parliament is also going to have about 50% ladies in that, hopefully so. And uh, no, I think I'll just have a quick, uh, maybe a buzzer round. I'll just have one question each, because, and that is what I've taken from uh, what all of you spoke. I'll just take a leaf out of your book, and then uh, we'll just close this session. Uh, Mr. Dhruv Sanayal talked about, you can just answer from there itself, I'll be here. You talk about the ingredient optimization. I think that is a very important aspect, and that'll uh, to bring down the cost also, and but how do you really make that kind of choice? I mean, are you using some kind of algorithms for that or some kind of you know, computer mathematical models? And also you have to look at the taste ultimately. Without compromising the taste, how do you really optimize for the ingredients? Yeah, uh, I hope it's not a googly. No, it's not a googly. It's a, the optimization story is very much relevant, especially on the emerging markets where cost is a big driver for optimization. And most of our customers are looking for great tasting, but <coughs> cost competitive product from our, from our side. And <coughs> we work with our uh, customers, but we work internally to look at optimizing the recipes in order to ensure that it meets the price points that our, cu our customers are looking for and their consumers are looking for. Uh, okay. At a very basic level, chocolate is not complicated. It's made of sugar, cocoa, and if it is chocolate, it's cocoa butter and liquor. And it's how you manage the components brings the optimization around it. Our optimization is more in the innovation side, more in terms of bringing a healthy snacking because uh, chocolate is uh, a lot of sugar 
and that is something that we are working with our customers and <coughs> primarily most of the chocolate companies in, in trying to bring down the sugar bear because it's going to be a issue going forward everywhere and that's something that we did very well with the launch of the second generation chocolate where we are reduced sugar by 40 percent in chocolate and that's a big step up from our perspective because uh, and, and, uh, and also making the recipe very uh, non-complicated, very simple recipe. Uh, okay. it didn't food process, processed food need not be very complicated in terms of labeling. Uh, we have shown the way in terms of doing so, and that's where we continue to optimize our product portfolio and the uh, recipes. So I think if that's, yeah, one yeah, yeah, If I may, I would like to add uh, something on, uh, you know, reduction of sugar and so on. So from, uh, from Ferrero's side, you know, we, be we are selling chocolate, right? So chocolate is about fat, cocoa, uh, sugar is about uh, hazelnut. And it's been there for uh, 50 years. Ferrero Rocher is there for 40 years now. So if tomorrow there is a substitution to sugar, to fat, to hazelnut, that is there, we should have known it, right? So today, you know, we are selling pleasure. When kids or adults have a bar of chocolate or have a, a praline, it's pleasure. So from Federal's side, we are much more focusing on portion control. So how we ensure that, you know, we are sensitizing mothers, fathers, those that buying product for the kids are sensitized. So today we are not, for example, not targeting kids in our advertisement. So we are only focusing on channels of adults and after a, a, a period of time uh, around seven or eight. And this has been already for more than 10 years existing at Ferro globally and also in India. So selling pleasure is key. Tomorrow, if you are asking me to reduce drastically the sugar or the fat, we will not go that way. So better to sensitize about the portion control that is there. So this is the, an important point for us. Yeah, that's, that's a good takeaway message. I wish the, the consumer activists, activists also accede to the fact that you know, everything cannot be brought down because I remember when FSSAI, they were always up in arms against us. They were used to put up the red flag saying that you know, the regulator is not doing anything. It's pro-industry. But then we had our own uh, limitations. Uh, also want to know from you, since you're importing most of the ingredients, I mean, what are the kind of uh, problems that you're facing? Well, you're importing, you're importing hazelnut, you said, you're importing palm oil, you said, you're importing. So, yeah. so we are importing finished product here in India. Yeah. So, and, but we are sourcing here in India, for example, sugar. Uh, we are sourcing uh, milk also in India. So we have a couple of uh, ingredients that are sourced in India to be produced in India. Uh, Tic Tac, for example, which is a sugar confectioner, is uh, fully made in India with the R&D developed here al also in India. Now we are thinking, also like my colleague, we are also moving towards, you know, the local taste. We are bringing the taste of India to India, <coughs> like mokwas or fennel or cardamom that is used. Of course, we have mint and then uh, orange that is international standard, but here we, have, we are localizing flavors. So yes, imported in India is a challenge because it has a cost. And you know, again, I will not come back on the <laughs> custom duties, but more you import ingredients at the high custom duties, higher the price is passed to, to the consumer. But this is things that, you know, with the R&D, we are trying to develop much more local for local, but also local to export. So this is also how we, we move yeah. things. Uh, uh, true. No, my, my concern was regarding the regulation on imports, like the standards for import. Are you comfortable with that? Or do you feel that there is needs to be some kind of change in the threshold values that you... So, yeah. Because FSS regulates the import standard. We are following all the local regulation. This, this is for sure. <laughs> we are compliant 100%, I would say. We are 100% compliant. Certification is done, so everything is done. You know, to, to sell in India and being a European uh, company, you know, coming to India 15 years ago, we need to... Uh, of course, we have the local expertise now and so on, but regulation is, is things that are changing quite uh, 
fast in India, yeah. quite fast, and you need to be uh, up, uh, up to date on, on that. Yeah, good point. Uh, Mr. Parvata, I mean, uh, taking a leaf out of his book, you talked about uh, the new regulations. Regulations need to improve. That is what you said. So what exactly are you talking about? You're talking about the regulation on the food additives and what kind of change that you expect from the regulator? Sorry, and, and for that to happen, uh, the exports uh, to sort of thrive, we need to make sure that we demonstrate clearly uh, the upliftment of our standards. Why should we then accept 1800 standards that we have? Why don't we elevate? It's good for our population, it's good for business, and it's also, I think, a mind shift change from compliance to more responsibility. Right. Oh, I mean, uh, that's a good uh, thought as a, as a big player, basic. They are uh, well comp well, well, quite similar to those of the codex standards. Huh, but they may not be uh, you know, those uh, standards like, uh, which, which are very, very tough and stringent. But yeah, from export perspective, obviously it is the importing country's requirements that everybody has to comply with, the food business operator. So thank you for that. But just to add on to yeah, that, sure. I think it's a little bit of a misnomer that we, ca we assume that the MSME cannot take an innovation. But I think if we put in the standards, it will force the ecosystem to come up with that innovation. And I think the Indian mind is so powerful, it will find the answers. And I think we should just give it a shot. Uh, true. I mean, uh, that is where I see a role for the academia institutes like ours to play. Like, you know, we need to yeah. plug those gaps and come together. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Kohli, in fact, impressed all of us here with, uh, with this uh, scheme which talked about, I mean, I was really impressed about the sustainability, uh, sustainability and innovation for sustainability. Of course, that's one company which is uh, doing pretty well. But I just want to know from you is, like, you know, what is, uh, you, you, I mean, if you could just throw a little more insight on the plastic use management that you're doing. You're talking about the, the, the plastic going back. Uh, if you could just elaborate a bit more for the audience. What is the kind of policy you have on the plastic use? I think on the three, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Thanks. Um, three parts to it. Internally, we look at recycle, reuse, and you know, reapply. Uh, yeah, reduce as well, of course. Yes, reduce. So there is plastic trays that used to be there in a lot of biscuits. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, that there in the biscuits and a lot of, so we continuously working on can we kind of reduce those plastic trays in the biscuits itself, the, the packaging itself, so that that's one. Um, and, and so that, that's a three frame philosophy, uh, as simple as that. So while one, one is collection, of course, on the ground, and I think all of us here were well versed with all the three uses of reducing, recycling, and you know, uh, recyclability of the entire thing. So th those are the three frameworks. Very, very serious about it. Keep experimenting, keep piloting. Of course, our products also, you know, go a lot of dif distance. So you have to be cognizant of that, that it should not break and people feel if the biscuit's broken and it's not full and all that happens. But we, and therefore, setting up more plants, getting closer to the consumers is a solution versus saying, oh, I can't do that. So we kind of look at how we can bring down the distance to the consumer there as well. So we used to be at 380 odd kilometers to our nearest distribution. We've come down to 220 odd kilometers. So we man we've kind of tracked that as well so that you're closer and therefore lesser use of plastic as well. Again, I'm, I'm going to take uh, the challenge to the team here. It doesn't stop there. The challenge that I keep to with the team is, you know, a lot of the packaging at that time was designed for general trade. Today, with a lot of the products which are there in modern trade, do you definitely need two layers of plastic? Can it be just one layer of plastic? Because the, the environment is air-conditioned, you know, all those areas are there. So why same packaging for GT versus modern trade? So those are kind of questions you have to keep, you know, pushing the boundaries and keep questioning your team. Can, can you look at designing different packaging or a lesser use of plastic there as well? I hope Great. I answer the question there. Thanks. Can we get to eat uh, the biscuits along with the packets, maybe five years down the line? And the, 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 the ink that we talk about is the food ink and the, the, pa the pack, the wrappers that we have are all uh, made from the biodegradable material. It's a good thought, but we don't make Ferraris, we make biscuits, I <laughs> 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 
No, but uh, no, no. Let me go back. To, let me go back to the mobile phones. I mean, uh, way back in 95, 96, when the mobile phones were introduced in the country, the call rates were as high as 32 rupees a minute, and we had to pay up for the incoming calls also. And things, technologies have really improved, and that uh, you know, things are uh, there to stay. So I something. just want to add on to a point on sure, on sure. the plastic. There's a lot of innovation happening out there, and uh, there's the element of biodegradability of plastics coming in. Uh, so my company is uh, also now working and uh, we're partnering with a few other in, uh, companies and bringing in that biodegradability here. I'm sure that in five years, ten years, that will be tackled. Right. So, great. Uh, now talking about, you talked about, uh, Gitigaji talked about innovations for customization. And one innovation that I see coming forward, looking forward, is the 3D printing. That is something I think where we can give the customized solutions to a consumer, and especially uh, with chocolates and the bakery products. And now, in fact, 3D has moved to 4D. I don't know, there, there's in fact, I've been told, I've not, never seen that, there's a restaurant in Italy which serves only the 3D printed food. Yeah. So that this customer just goes in, he orders like, this is the kind of material I want to have, this should be the nutritional benefit, Sticks and you develop it. a product for me. So when Hershey's could come out with the, the specifically those Bodhiwala chocolates, <laughs> I'm sure that you might be looking forward to having something like uh, no, a 3D, a 4D printing in your mind to develop such product in the future. So I think uh, even before 3D became popular, we were doing that in Hershey Chocolate World, which is what you referred to in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We do have uh, you know, this chocolate world where you can choose your chocolate, what toppings you want, how you would like it, what are the, whether it has caramel or crumbles or whatever, sprinkles on top, the kind of packaging that you would like, what name you would have, what printout you would have. So I think the customization absolutely has been possible even in the past. Could we take it here more? We could. Uh, and I, I would never say never. It's not something that we are currently necessarily focusing on. Like we said, we do want to first just reach out to the mass of consumers uh, that <laughs> India represents and uh, really make an impact on them first before we go on to 3D printing, but absolutely within scope. And maybe one day we will have a Hershey chocolate world here in wow. India. Wonderful. <laughs> Inshallah we'll have it. Uh, great. I mean, uh, as an academician and researcher, look forward to working with all of you. I mean, I see a good uh, ecosystem which has been built in. And uh, maybe from uh, three to from three to four D, from why not from four D to five D? Then we have five Gs here. So uh, now I'll just open it for a quick uh, two or three questions. In case if you have that, yeah, please. Uh, my question is to Mr. Rajneet from Britannia. Uh, you are, you, you are sort of saddled with the responsibility of being the guardian for the bakery industry. I am from the bakery industry myself and uh, have also worked in Britannia for a good 10 years. My concern is uh, in many echelons of our society, there is a growing uh, perception about maida. You know, refined wheat flour, some negative health perceptions about, around that. You know, that's going to affect our industry in some way down the line. Is there any thought on protecting the industry, you know, from that perspective? No, thank you. Uh, no, it's, it's a, so you're a Britannian yourself. You, you, you know how we look at this as well. So uh, internally, of course, there is work that's happening on, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not starting with a framework saying, you know, Maida is bad or things should not be there, Maida. Of course, there is there's a role that every uh, of our, you know, this plays and, and uh, portion being one we heard today, you know, in chocolates and all being one way of looking at it. But having said that, there is there is Atta biscuits that we have and we're working on that. For example, our milk bikis biscuit which is there and it's very strong and popular here in, you know, UP and all Bihar and most states which is there uh, is all, all Atta. Uh, we have, uh, you know, while today and I'm reading in front, millets has become so big and it's become the Shriyan food and I'm, I'm really glad that as an India as we're looking, really waking up to it. But Nutri-Choice biscuits always had millets, you know. You should know the Nutri-Choice range. We've had things that we, ragi biscuits are there. There is, you know, there is biscuits for protein. There's biscuits for diabetics. So there is there is work to be done on various factors, not just one element of it. Is the way I look at it, you know, uh, you know, where you can reduce sugar, 
where you can reduce sodium, where you can reduce salt, where, where are the areas you can bring in more nutrition in uh, as an industry. Uh, and as I said, as the vision is to become a responsible total global food company. The responsible world comes first there as well. So it, it doesn't have to be in one facet and just picking one area. I would say that you have to look at uh, multiple areas where you can go there. Having said that, very, very open and keep working on how can we keep, uh, you know, improving uh, all ingredients of our business. So yeah. Thank you. You can take one more question. Yeah. Oh, I see competitors sitting here, so how do you plan to take on each other? So. They compete and complement. Yeah. Actually, I, I personally don't look at it at all like that. The way I look at it is, you know, the consumption of chocolates in India is about 150 grams. It has moved from 50 grams to 150 grams in the last uh, five years. Uh, the consumption of chocolates in the US is 10 kgs per capita. Yeah, all of these numbers. So the way I look at it is there is enough and more for all of us to coexist. Just create absolutely brilliantly designed products. Ensure you're catering to the consumers like I've spoken about earlier. And uh, I, I don't see that as, as a, it's not a competition at all. We're all in this together to ensure we kind of serve the consumers of India. Do you want to add? Competition is on a ring, yeah? so we are not on the ring. Yeah? So <laughs> 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 Say, so they compete for the, sw the yeah, sweet yeah, yeah. taste. So I think it's uh, time for me to now actually uh, you know, express my heartfelt gratitude to all the esteemed panelists. I mean, it was a wonderful discussion, quite a lot of ins insightful discussion. Uh, there's a lot of learning, I'm sure. All of you must have uh, gained something out of this discussion that we've had over the last hour or so. It's very, very engrossing. So thank you very much. Pleasure to have all of you here and I uh, look forward to be working with you. And if uh, I have to just sum up at all, I would just say the key words are innovations, consistency, durability, optimization, and working together. Let the academia, industry, government come together, even the regulator come together and see a better India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panel. So we have. Uh,